On November 25, in the year 731, the brilliant mathematician Leonhard Euler sent a letter to Christian Goldbach including a new mathematical constant he came up with, which he called E. But what is E? Numerically, this question can be answered further simply by just hopping on into a calculator and plugging E into it. By computing the value of this mystery constant, we can see that it equals 2.71828 something something something. This brings up the question of what this constant stands for and what we can actually do with it. My goal today is first to come home and know what this 2.718281 something 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 stands for, but what is really more important is that I want to give you a general intuition for what a derivative is and how this number relates and follows from the derivative of exponential functions like 2 to the x. But the story begins in the 17th century when two famous mathematicians argued about which of them is the better one and who set the basis of modern calculus. Of course we are talking about none other than Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Today I don't want to argue about who of them invented the methods of calculus, but about calculus itself. As a lot of mathematics, calculus and especially the derivative developed from the general intuition of physics. When taking a look at the basis of classical mechanics, we can see the interaction of velocity, time, distance and acceleration. Let's take a car which moves at some speed over some time through some space. The function representing this motion can be summed into a ST diagram. The question I want to ask you now is, how can we define from looking at this drawn ST diagram if the motion of the car is continuous, accelerated and if it is, is it a constant acceleration? And this is the point which matters. If the car changes its motion, the graph visible within the ST diagram changes as well. The only way the shown motions are different is by their slope. Okay, but what does this now mean? Let's take a look at a finer example where the motion of the car follows a linear pattern seen by the straight line. We derive to vt by taking a look at the change in distance over the change in time. This is probably what you have learned in high school as a gradient triangle. When taking a look at linear functions, this is very easy because the slope will always be continuous and the velocity so forth will always be the same, in this case exactly 1. This means that the graph describing vt is just a constant continuous value. We easily derive this by using mathematical intuition, but let's take a look at another example where the car is accelerating with a constant acceleration. Now st is not linear anymore, but quadratic instead. And vt doesn't follow the same pattern as earlier, and we cannot just set it to a constant value because we have a motion with change. For the gradient triangle, this just means that it is not constant as before. The values change due to the inconsistent slope of the graph. When looking at a dt, so a difference in time of 1, we can see that ds, so the difference in distance, gets larger when we go up the graph and gets less when we go down the graph. You can actually see it shifting in size just by the visual difference. It gets even clearer when looking at the same example but now showing a tangent line. The shown green tangent line now gives a visual representation on how the slope changes over the graph. The slope of the tangent line is higher when it rises up the graph and lower when it falls down the graph. So what do we do with that? The clear definition is that for high values of dt, we can only define the slope at vt at a very small number of points on the graph. So the ideal situation is obviously that we want to describe the slope of the graph at every point on the graph. We do that by letting dt, so the difference in time, go infinitely small so we can get down to the point where all points are infinitesimal close to each other. And this is what sticks all the way at the root of calculus. With an infinitely small dt, we can derive the slope of the function at every single point on the graph. In a more mathematical sense, we let the difference in time approach zero while dividing the difference in s over the difference in time. 
This gives us the initial limit vt equals the limit of dt approaching 0 while dividing ds over dt. At every point of the graph with dt coming close to 0 but not being 0. With this in mind we can easily derive vt by just computing the values and we come up with a linear function. This shows us that the slope of the given function changes but that change is continuous. This concept is defined by several algebraic rules which I will go over in more detail in future episodes. In general this process works for all functions, but still there are some exceptions here and there. For example the derivative of f of x equal to sine x, which is cosine of x. And there's some beautiful visual proof for this paradigm, which I'm going to talk more about in a future series. But for today, a short explanation for derivatives is more than enough. If you want to understand the topic more deeply, I guarantee I will make a more detailed video about it in the near future. But let's go to the type of functions which are important for today's lesson. The exponentials. Let's take a look at the function f of x equal to 2 to the x. But let's think of this function as an input in time and the output is some sort of population mass. Like for example the population of Algier in a lake. Those grow at exponential scales which converts our function to m of a of t equal to 2 to the t. When looking at t equal to 0 the function gives us 2 to the 0 equal to 1. Furthermore, if we take a look at 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, and 2 to the 4, and so on, we can see that the overall population mass doubles each day. For the derivative of this function, we now want dm over dt, so the change in population over the change in time. When taking a look at the rate of change over one day, we can see that the rate of change equals the population size at the start of the day. Let's take the change in population, so dm, from 4 to 5 over the course of one day. We can see that this just is 16 divided by 1, giving us the initial value of the population from the start of the day. This is true for all dt's taken from the graph. We can always plot the difference in population over the course of one day equals the initial population size at the start of the day. This of course lets us propose that the rate of change of 2 to the t, so the derivative of 2 to the t, is just itself. And this is generally a good argument, and it is definitely leading us into the right direction. But we have to consider that for the rate of change of a function, so for the derivative of a function, we want smaller and smaller values of dt. This means that we have to instead look at the population mass at a tenth of a day, a hundredth of a day, or even a billionth of a day. So what we want is 2 to the t plus dt minus 2 to the t all over dt. The difference in population mass over the difference in time, but at a very, very narrow point in time. To understand what the real derivative of an exponential function is, there's sadly no good way to give you a visual intuition for the given problem. We will have to take a look at the numerical properties of exponential functions in order to succeed at finding the derivative. So let us take a closer look at the term dm over dt of t equal to 2 to the t plus dt minus 2 to the t all over dt, which is the derivative of the function dm which we have defined earlier. A key property of this function and a key property of any exponential functions is that we can write this as 2 through dt plus 2 through the dt minus 2 through dt all over dt. This redirects us from additive ideas like the addition of tiny changes in time to multiplicative ideas like general rates. What is so beautiful and intentional about this is that we can completely factor out 2 through dt as so. And we have to remember that the derivative describes the function when dt approaches 0. This seems incredibly unreasonable at first, but what's important is that we just separated the part of change, so 2 through dt, the difference in time, from 2 through dt. This just means that the rate of change is not focused to what point we started, and we've just created a proportionality. And if we go ahead and plug this into your calculator, we get smaller and smaller, or should I say, more detailed and more detailed values for some mystery constant 
which at the end approaches around 0.6931. And you really don't have to think about that mystery constant just yet. But what is important is that a key property of exponential functions is that the derivative of them is just itself times some mystery constant. And this makes sense, because we've seen that the derivative earlier was around itself, and now it is just itself times some proportionality constant. And there's nothing special about the number 2. If we take a look at different exponential functions, we can see that another mystery constant arises. The obvious question arises if there's a pattern connecting them. Let's for example take a look at the number 8, which gives us a constant at about 2.0794. And if you take a closer look, you would maybe, but just maybe, notice that this is 3 times the mystery constant of 2, which directly connects these two functions over their basis of 2. So we can obviously see that there's some kind of connection. But what is it? And what does 2 have to do with 0.693 and 8 with 2.0794. Another simple question which we can ask is whether there is some kind of base where the constant comes out to be 1. So the question is what we got to plug in for a so that dAt over dt is equal to at. That would mean that the derivative of that mystery function is not just proportional to itself, but it would actually be itself. And there is! It's actually that special constant e which we talked about at the start of the video. That is about 2.71828. That is what defines the properties of e. It's that when you search for the proportionality constant, it will give you 1. So we know that all exponential functions are proportional to their own derivative. But e to the t alone is the only function where the derivative is equal to itself. One way to think about this is when we take a look at the graph of e to the t and we place a tangent line on the graph, we can see that the slope of the tangent line is always the same as the height of the given t value input. The existence of e to the t is the definition of exponential functions and gives us a great answer to the shown mystery constants. I am happy to show you this definition and give you a more deeper insight about potentials, exponentials and natural logs. But because this video took a long time to make and I haven't uploaded for over a month, I am not going to include this in this video. I am still looking forward to making a shorter future episode where I am going to explain it in more detail and with more relations to integration and more. For now, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you have a great day. Feel free to ask any questions down in the comment section and I am looking forward to seeing you soon.